My name is Ryan Burr, and for my final Econ 303 presentation, I will be discussing the ongoing battle for a living minimum wage in the United States. So just for some background, the federal minimum wage is a pay rate that all non-exempt employers must adhere to in the U.S. It was first established during the FDR administration under the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act, and at the time it was 25 cents an hour and excluded many trades, including majority black occupations. The federal minimum wage increased from $4.75 to $7.25 between 1996 and 2009, but as of March 2021, it has been stagnant ever since. It's important to note that this is just the federal rule, as 29 states and Washington, D.C. have a minimum wage over $7.25 an hour. This is a map from Yahoo News, which will give you an idea of how different states fare in comparison to the federal government. Coastal states like Oregon and New York are at over $12 an hour, while states like Georgia and Wyoming are at $5.15 an hour. Occupations protected by that Fair Labor Standards Act are still set at $7.25 in these states, but exempt employers are free to pay workers $5 an hour, which is just below an $11,000 annual salary. In February 2021, President Joe Biden introduced a $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill that actually included a $15 federal minimum wage by 2025. The bill was signed into law on March 11th, but the minimum wage addition was killed in the House about a week before. Eight Democrat senators voted no, including Arizona Representative Kirsten Sinema, pictured here on the right giving her controversial animated thumbs down. The $15 addition was introduced by Vermont, by Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, and many are still fighting for it, including those at the Economic Policy Institute and progressive Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. This simple graph shows a timeline of America's federal minimum wage. As you can see, it has flatlined since 2009 and has failed to come remotely close to what it was adjusted for inflation nearly 50 years ago. This is primarily a large problem because, according to the U.S. Census, 34.5 million Americans lived in poverty in 2019. Again, over half of the states have a minimum wage above the federal, but $7.25 an hour leaves an adult and two children well below the poverty line. Many people assume that minimum wage jobs are generally held by teenagers, but the Economic Policy Institute estimates over half the workers who would benefit from an increased minimum wage are between the ages of 25 and 54. This map to the right shows the percentage of Americans in poverty in each state, with darker areas representing, at least, or representing rates of at least 30%. If we go back to this state minimum wage map, you'll see that $9, $10, or $11 an hour isn't even enough to keep poverty rates low. As for policy costs, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that 1.3 million jobs could disappear in the next five years under a $15 minimum wage. The COVID-19 pandemic destroyed 3.8 million American hospitality jobs, which is the industry that would primarily be impacted by any change to the minimum wage, as you can see in this graph. Almost 40% of workers that make a minimum wage are part of the leisure and hospitality industry. Additionally, it is estimated that the $15 wage would increase the federal budget deficit by $54 billion over the next decade. For an anecdotal example of these consequences, we can look at Long Beach, California, where grocery stores were asked to pay employers an extra $4 an hour in hazard pay due to the pandemic. The Kroger Corporation closed two stores, eliminating jobs for over 100 people. According to the CBO, when we're looking at potential job loss from the wage hike, over half of those unemployed workers could completely fall out of the labor force by 2025, meaning these people are no longer even actively looking for a job. This chart over on the right is from the Washington Post and shows what job loss could look like for each increase in minimum wage. At $10 and even $12, it's almost microscopic on a national scale, but $15 an hour inches closer to a seven-figure loss. Because of this job loss, we could obviously see some spike in unemployment, which may increase government spending on social safety net programs. As for the benefits of the policy, there would simply be a general improvement of living conditions for millions of Americans. According to the EPI, a $15 minimum wage by 2025 would see increased pay for approximately 21% of the national workforce, and this could lead to a total of $107 billion in extra wages. In the 1960s American Civil Rights era, minimum wage hikes were tied to a significant drop in racial income inequality. During this time, the disparity between black and white income improved by almost 20%. If a $15 minimum wage were to be put in place, 25% of those who would benefit would be black and Latino women, and 28% that benefit would have children.
This chart is going to show you the growth of American wealth inequality by race over time. Back in 1963, you can see that the points were fairly close together. But as time passed, white families grew their wealth at an exponentially higher rate compared to black and Hispanic families. According to the EPI Family Budget Calculator, a single adult living in the rural United States will need to earn at least $19 an hour to adequately cover 2025 living costs, and the current $7.25 minimum wage is one-third of what an average American family needs to live. The CNBC chart on the right shows the current minimum wage in each state compared to a living wage. I apologize for the chart size, and I know it's not too visible, but you can see in every state that the blue minimum wage dot is far to the left of the yellow living wage dot, even in states like California with a $14 minimum wage. Millions of people are working extensive hours every day, and the paycheck still isn't nearly enough to survive. One last fact for the benefits of a minimum wage hike. In 2014, the Obama administration proposed a smaller increase to $10.10 an hour. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimated that this would carry 900,000 families out of poverty and increase the income for 16.5 million low-wage workers by 2016. This proposal did not pass. If the United States passed a $15 minimum wage, the winners would be fairly obvious. As I said before, 21% of American workers, or 17 million people, would see a wage boost by 2025. Additionally, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago estimates that just a $1 raise for a minimum wage worker translates to an additional $2,080 in consumer spending over the course of a year. Small businesses have been hit especially hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, and cities like San Luis Obispo have made significant efforts to curb the damage. If a $15 minimum wage increases consumer spending in the slightest, these hurting small businesses could benefit greatly. This chart from the Center for American Progress shows minimum wage progression during American recessions. As you can see in the gray columns, Congress was able to pass a wage hike of some sort during several catastrophic economic times. We're in the middle of a disaster right now due to the pandemic, and very little has changed for workers compared to what happened in 2008. I said before that job loss from a minimum wage hike could force the government to spend more on social programs, but the opposite is also possible. According to the EPI, spending on important safety net and education programs could fall by anywhere between $13.4 and $31 billion in the coming years in the fallout of a $15 minimum wage. In this Washington Post graph on the right, you can see that gradual increases in minimum wage cause a spike in jobs that pay more and a drop in jobs that pay less. This effect diminishes over time, but shows that wage increase won't necessarily kill jobs that pay a fair rate, just ones that don't. Additionally, the National Bureau of Economic Research reports a minimum wage hike could increase crime rates in American age 16 to 24. I personally believe that any concrete causality is extremely difficult to prove here, but the Bureau con concluded that a crime spike could generate criminality, criminal externality costs of nearly $2.5 billion. For a labor market analysis, this data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that workers who did not graduate from high school were particularly affected by the pandemic, with unemployment rising to 21% and still at nearly double 2019 levels. In contrast, the unemployment rate for workers with a bachelor's degree or higher is returning to 2019 levels. Given that the average wage in leisure and hospitality is below $15 an hour, those businesses would need to manage the impact of additional costs further reducing net revenue. An increase in the minimum wage would force many small businesses to increase prices, which could reduce demand for goods and services or reduce hiring and hours. On the other hand, there are a myriad of different reasons a higher minimum wage would improve the labor market. If workers are better equipped to survive, employers will spend less on issues that could otherwise arise. Through my research and personal analysis, I have concluded that drastic change and some more time is necessary to solve severe poverty in the United States. That is obviously a big blanket statement, but it is possible. I think the minimum wage has a different definition in Washington, D.C. than it does for those that need it to survive. For the majority of low-wage workers, multiple minimum wage jobs are necessary to avoid starvation and homelessness, whether it be for themselves or their children. I can't speak with total certainty to the reason eight Democrats voted against a wage hike. However, many argue that it is too divisive and claim Republicans would stifle it in the Senate. While this may be true, it's frustrating to see politicians that claim to represent the working class cower the second they have the ability to pass laws. Many on the left agree with a minimum wage increase, and many on the right disagree. This is not surprising. 
According to Pew, 67% of all Americans believe a wage hike of any sort would be good. I don't think this matters much, as citizens have little control over what politicians do once they leave the polls. It's important to be optimistic, however, and if anything, it is an indication that the national attitude towards poor suffering is improving. All of the numbers and statistics I've just laid out are obviously completely hypothetical, because it's economics, and the American economy will do whatever it pleases with the changes that we make. I'm glad this conversation is at the forefront of many political and economic debates, however, and can only hope Americans soon have a better future to look towards. Thank you. And there's my work cited. I had roughly 15 uh, sources. I get 18, so there's the small font.